You're watching Tag TV. Welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we'll provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's take a look at the headlines first. Unknown gunmen continue to eliminate terrorists in Pakistan. India calls for zero tolerance for terror sponsors at UN. And Islamabad now resorting at deploying hybrid terrorists to keep Kashmir tense and burning. In the past two years, more than a dozen terrorists have been killed mysteriously in Pakistan. These slain terrorists were associated with groups such as Lashkar-e Taiba, Hizbul Mujahideen, and Jaish e Mohammed. According to reports, recently a terrorist associated with Lashkar-e Taiba. Habibullah was killed by unknown gunmen who opened fire at him in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Earlier, a close aide of LAT chief Hafiz Saeed was killed by unknown gunmen near his residence in Karachi. A report. In Pakistan, several high-profile and wanted terrorists have been eliminated in a similar fashion in the last few months. In a series of mysterious killings in Pakistan, one more was added on evening of December 17. According to reports, a terrorist associated with Lashkar-e-Taiba, Habibullah, was killed by unknown gunmen who opened fire at him in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. The latest episode comes after the killing of Hanzal Adnan, a close associate of LED founder and a mastermind of the 2611 Mumbai terror attacks, Hafi Saeed. On the intervening night of 2nd and 3rd December, lashkar e taiba terrorist Hanzala Adnan was shot dead by unknown gunmen near his residence in Karachi. Adnan was considered to be a close aide of terror group chief Hafi Said. Four bullets were found in his body. Hanzala was the mastermind of the 2015 Uddampur attack wherein a border security force convoy was targeted by the LAT terrorists. The reports of Habibullah's killing surfaced on the same day where there were unconfirmed reports of Daud Ibrahim, India's most wanted fugitive, allegedly hospitalized due to poisoning by unknown people. Reports say that the mastermind behind the 1993 Mumbai serial blasts, Daud Ibrahim, has been residing in Pakistan for several years. The devastating bombings resulted in over 250 casualties and left thousands injured. Terrorists which were protected by the Pakistani army who were kept in safe houses for a long time are now being killed one by one and one of them was in fact poisoned inside a Pakistani prison. Is it the incapability of Pakistani army to handle the security situation uh, in uh, the country? Yes, definitely it shows incapability of the Pakistani army because terrorism or terrorist is a strategic asset as far as Pakistani army is concerned. Pakistani army thinks that by using terrorists and terrorist acts it can get India onto the negotiations table. So therefore, it protects this asset regularly uh, and in a very proper manner. All the killings in Pakistan have similar modus operandi. The unidentified attackers leave no trace or evidence behind once they eliminate a terrorist. Their approach is to arrive carry out their duties and then depart. 
These unidentified assailants have expanded their arsenal of techniques to include poisoning in addition to using guns to take out their target. Inside Pakistan's central jail at Dera Ghazi Khan, lashkar e taiba terrorist Sajid Mir, who gained notoriety for his part in organizing and carrying out the Mumbai 2611 attacks, was poisoned. The series of assassinations began after a failed attempt on the life of the LED founder and the mastermind of the 2008 Mumbai attacks, Hafiz Saeed in Lahore in 2021. In the first two weeks of November this year, three senior LAT and JEM terrorists, including a close aide of Maulana Masood Azhar and the chief recruiter of LAT, were shot dead. Other key terrorists who were shot dead by unknown gunmen include Riyaz Ahmed, alias Abu Qasim, Maulana Ziaur Rahman, Mufti Qasir Farooqi, Mulla Sardar Hussain Arain, Paramjit Singh Banjwar. Bashir Ahmed Pir, Sayyid Noor, Sayyid Khalid Raza, and Mystery Zahoor Ibrahim. Most uh, uh, important uh, happening that is happening in Pakistan is basically a lot of terrorists who uh, who are on the payroll of Pakistani army are being killed. So, how do do you carry out assessment of such situation? Is it a part of a gang war? what we have to understand is that it is not very uncommon for the criminal or the terrorist organizations to engage in internal power struggle because they want to gain prominence in the pakistani society they want to gain control over resources they want to get more money so therefore such rivalries when they are fighting on the same turf leads to targeted killings Many defense experts say that terrorists in Pakistan are being killed in gang rivalry. In recent months, some key operatives working for Pakistan's ISI have been killed in various gang wars in Karachi and other places. None of the killers has been identified or arrested by Pakistan security agencies. In a new dimension of terror that India is facing because of Pakistan, drones flying in dump everything from weaponry to narcotics to counterfeit currency. Recently, in a veiled attack on Pakistan at the United Nations Security Council's open debate, India called on the international community to condemn cross-border illicit supply of weapons. Here's a report. I will state that India attaches high importance to preventing, combating. and eradicating the illicit trade in small arms and light weapons India continues its strong and focused commitment to help UN member states build capacity to prevent and counter terrorism amongst states along with huge monetary contributions in the fight against terrorism new delhi is always very vocal about this global threat recently in a veiled attack on pakistan At the United Nations Security Council's open debate, India called on the international community to condemn cross-border illicit supply of weapons. UN peacekeeping missions could support speaking at the council. India's permanent representative to the UN, Ruchira Kamboj, emphasized that India was facing a serious challenge of cross-border supply of illicit weapons by means of drones. and stockpile management Cambodge stated the increase in volume and the quality of the arsenal acquired by terrorist organizations is a reminder that they enjoy the support and sponsorship of states having fought the scourge of terrorism for several decades india is aware of the perils of the diversion and illicit transfer of small arms and ammunition to armed non-state actors and terrorists We have suffered immensely due to cross-border terrorism and violence carried out by terrorist groups using these illicit weapons smuggled across our borders including now through the use of drones. The increase in volume and the quality of the arsenal acquired by these terrorist organizations reminds us time and again that they cannot exist without the sponsorship or support of states. 
Indian officials have reported drones coming in from Pakistan to drop weapons and drugs for terrorists in Punjab, Jammu and Kashmir and Rajasthan. Last year till November, at least 22 such drones were reported captured by Indian agencies and 266 drone infiltrations were reported during the year. Not only that, recently security forces recovered a suspicious box which contained arms and ammunition including IED, pistol, magazines, grenades suspected to have been dropped by a drone on the outskirts of Jammu. Arian Boy drones, made in China and used by Pakistan, transport everything from assault rifles and pistols to military-grade explosive RDX IDs such as stiffened bombs, drugs and counterfeit currency. Participating in the UNSC Council session on threats and risks to international security from the illicit export of weapons, Cambodia also warned about the collusion between terrorists and certain countries that arm them. The illicit traffic of small arms and light weapons and related ammunition is a key enabler for sustaining conflicts by armed and terrorist groups. This necessitates the need for coordinated efforts by states to limit the acquisition of small arms and light weapons by such actors. It is therefore important that this Council exercises a zero tolerance to terror actors and their sponsors, their possession and misuse of small arms and light weapons. Frequent park drone incursions are seen as symptomatic out of a frustration arising out of terrorist infiltration drastically pulled down. Besides that, they imply lower costs and fewer terrorist lives in danger. Security analysts are concerned that this will be India's most difficult challenge on the Western Front in the future. Recent weeks in Kashmir have witnessed a surge in attacks on soft targets and most of them were shot by hybrid terrorists. They are the unlisted radicalized persons who carry out terror strikes and slip back into their routine life. Security forces are considering them as a new threat and challenge in the valley. Recently, Jammu and Kashmir police apprehended three hybrid terrorists who were involved in the attack on a policeman in Srinagar. A report. One of the core elements of Pakistan's foreign policy that it relentlessly pursues is keep Kashmir tense and burning. Pakistan's plots vis-a-vis -vis India are both sinister and deadly. But having failed in all its diabolical designs, Pakistan has now employed a new, unconventional tactic of using hybrid terrorists to achieve its objectives. Hybrid terrorists are neither typical terrorists who swear allegiance to one or the other terrorist group, nor do they rely on conventional modes of carrying out terrorist activities. But they are radicalized enough to execute terrorist operations and then easily blend back into society. Lately, there has been a surge in attacks on soft targets across the valley, including in Srinagar raising alarm among the local populace. Most of these attacks have been executed by pistol-wielding youth who do not appear on the radar of the security agencies as recognized terrorists. Recently, security forces managed to apprehend three hybrid terrorists involved in the attack on their policemen. According to police officials, the conspiracy of the attack was hatched by one Pakistan-based terrorist who got in touch with the local mastermind Danish Ahmed Mullah. The plan of killing policemen of duty was hatched by a designated terrorist now in Pakistan by the name of Arjuman Guljar of Kharwatpura in Puloma district, known by the codename of 
Hamza Burhan. Is that correct? So he's the start point as far as we are concerned. He hatches a conspiracy and uh, he has caches of pistols here and there hidden. He arranges three persons to kill. In a way, the mastermind here is one Danish Ahmad Mala, son of Gulam Muhammad Mala, a resident of Hamdania Colony, where actually our constable was living. These Pakistan nurtured hybrid terrorists predominantly target unarmed individuals, such as businessmen, activists, off duty policemen, who are unlikely to offer resistance. They skillfully leverage technology and social media platforms to disseminate messages of violence and intimidation. Their modus operandi are a combination of traditional insurgency elements and the sophistication of modern warfare. Security officials say their selection of target is anything but random. Their approach entails careful observation of movement patterns of the target and identifying vulnerable points in their target's daily routine. The individuals responsible for spotting and facilitating attacks might not be on the police list, but they possess the means and intent to carry out killings similar to mercenary shooters hired to eliminate specific targets. As a result, the security forces are grappling with unprecedented challenges in combating these elusive adversaries. The hybrid terrorists operate covertly, skillfully mingling with the civilian population, which makes it extremely difficult for the security forces to identify and neutralize them. It becomes pretty difficult to identify a person who's going to suddenly spring up as a hybrid terrorist. Whereas for the case of a conventional terrorist, the details of such a person are available with the security forces operating in that area and the latest electronic surveillance means are employed to keep a tab on him or her as the case may be. But this luxury is not available for a hybrid terrorist because it is not known till he or she has carried out the attack. And more often than not, such people carry out attacks, ensuring that there are no CCTV cameras operating in that area, ensuring that the place where they're carrying out the attack is not a high threat area, as a result of which, their appearances are rarely captured. Hence, to counter hybrid terrorism is much more challenging for security forces as compared to capturing a conventional terrorist. Despite the ongoing turmoil, the communities in Jammu and Kashmir are rallying together, rejecting violence and fostering unity to counter this menacing threat. Education and awareness plays vital roles in dismantling the ideology that fuels hybrid terrorism. While the road to peace in Jammu and Kashmir may be fraught with challenges, a collective endeavor coupled with addressing the root cause instill hope for a future where tranquility and harmony will prevail and not chaos and violence. Over the years, thousands of people have vanished in Balochistan as a result of a brutal crackdown led by the military. Global media outlets have reported that hundreds of bodies of suspected armed separatists and political activists have been discovered in the unrest-plagued province, pointing to extrajudicial killings by Pakistani security forces. Now, the women in Balochistan have decided that they will stand together against the oppression if they don't want to pick up the dead bodies of their loved ones in the future. 
Leading an unprecedented movement against the Baloch genocide, thousands of women have taken to the streets as part of the long march. A report. The woman on the screen is Zarina Baloch, wife of Shabir Baloch, who was picked up by the Pakistan Army on October 4, 2016 in Balochistan. Zarina has been running from pillar to post, trying to find her husband. She has almost given her hope and now she is asking if she should declare herself a widow. Zarina is not the only victim of Pakistan's brutality in Balochistan. Like her, thousands of others are searching for their loved ones. Now the women in Balochistan have decided that they will stand together against the oppression if they don't want to pick up the dead bodies of their loved ones in the future. Leading an unprecedented movement against the Baloch genocide, thousands of women have taken to the streets as part of the long march. They march from Turbat to Quetta, aimed at highlighting human rights violations by Pakistani state authorities in Balochistan. The long march was organized by the Baloch Yak Jahiti Committee to raise awareness about enforced disappearances and extrajudicial killings in Balochistan. Pakistan security forces detained a large number of women protesters and Baloch activists. The police erected barricades on the highway in Kohlu to intercept thousands of protesters marching to Islamabad. <laughs> Over the years, thousands of people have vanished in Balochistan as a result of a brutal crackdown led by the military. Global media outlets have reported that hundreds of bodies of suspected armed separatists and political activists have been discovered in the unrest-plagued province, pointing to extrajudicial killings by Pakistani security forces. The exploitation of resources and oppression of the populace are what fuel the insurgency. But Pakistan, which is in denial, accuses foreign countries of being responsible, a claim that makes no sense. Baloch separatists have been angry at mining and energy projects in the region. They say there are no benefits for them, as most new jobs have gone to outsiders, while locals already battling crushing poverty are being pushed off their land. Similarly, the situation in Sindh has turned from bad to worse. Sindhis have been suffering from the worst form of political oppression and forced conversion for the past 75 years. There is no law prevailing in Balochistan and Sindh. Uh, Army's military uh, rule is in, uh, unofficially uh, in Balochistan and Sindh. In Sindh also, uh, the biggest issue in Sindh is uh, religious minorities. About 1,000 minority girls are kidnapped, raped, forcefully converted into Islam and then forcefully married to some older people. This is going on unnoticed. Activists from Baloch and Sindhi groups are holding demonstrations worldwide against park atrocities. They are agitating for the release of all missing persons. People in Balochistan are demanding freedom from all forms of slavery and humiliation. The world watches but stays silent. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. 
We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsaatnin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care. You're watching Tag TV.